Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'd like to welcome Dr. Ruslan. Alhamdulillah, we're here tonight. Uh, tonight is actually the exception. Usually we would have the classes for nature of man and the psychology of the human soul. But tonight is an exception. And hopefully tonight we'll get some insight from Dr. Ruslan from the intimate conversations that he has had with our beloved Professor Al-Atas about this matter. So hopefully tonight uh, will benefit everyone. And I think uh, we can start, inshallah, Doctor. So if you are ready. Okay. Thank you very much. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu wa salam. 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 Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ubiqa wal khatib ma sabaqa wa nasa ila al-haq ila al-haq wa al-hal ila al-sirati al-mustaqim sallallahu ala alihi wa sahbihi haqqa qadihi wa muqadahi al-azim amma ba'na al-hala wa qadahi wa billahi al-alihi wa al-azim Assalamualaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Tonight I'm feel very happy because I'm going to talk about our great master, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that's why I uh, just now bought a new shirt because just to talk about him. No? <laughs> okay. So there, there are so many things that we have to mention about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But I think we don't have more time to talk about that. But I just. I uh, want to choose some of uh, the aspect that we need to highlight. And I already highlighted that in some of my programs. And I just want to repeat it again, some of those some of those statements regarding Rasulullah SAW. Because now I think uh, our people, especially among, even among the Muslims, they think that Rasulullah is just a uh, normal human being. I think uh, our, our people also, it's not uh, among the non-Muslim, even the Muslim also think he is just a uh, normal human being. So it's not uh, different from us and it is not different from other prophets also. But uh, that's why we have to highlight again some of his aspect and the right true nature of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, because when we see at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we look at his tradition, we will find out that uh, he, when he decided, he decided what were truly God's decision and what God decreed to him. Okay? That, that uh, is what was, uh, uh, he did. Uh, he did not say something which is not from God. So that, that's why uh, it is being clear but in Al Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Inna Ladi na yubayyunka, inna ma yubayyunwa." That what Allah says. Surely those who pledge allegiance to you pledge also allegiance to me, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So it is uh, almost like the same when it comes to the question about obedience. So that's why I always. Uh, repeatedly say that uh, Rasulullah SAW did not share with Allah in terms of Tawheed. Allah is still uh, uh, remain as one. The Wahdani aspect is still with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So the Shahada Ashadu Ala Ilaha Illallah. So the Allah there is only uh, meant for the Tawheed part. But when it comes to Rasulullah, he share with Allah when it comes to obedience, the Ta'ah aspect. So the ta'ah aspect is something uh, being shared between Allah and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's why Allah only some of the verses it is being said that when you obey Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, actually you obey me. And some of uh, those ayat also like uh, this ayat uh, mentioned that when you pledge allegiance to you to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Actually, you pledge allegiance to me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this point also being emphasized in another verse, 
in Surah 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 An Najm, uh, 54, uh, 53, the verse uh, four. And this uh, point is also being emphasized in this ayat. Uh, he uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, says that he, meaning that Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does not speak from his own selfish desires. Rather, his speech is nothing but inspired inspiration. Ma yantiqu anil hawa illa wahyu yuha, something like that, you know. So he, he does not speak from his own selfish desire. But this is something got to do with Al-Quran, relate significantly with wahyu. And other thing that Rasulullah did is not actually wahyu, but he is being influenced by the wahyu, by the Al-Quran. So don't, don't uh, mis misunderstood that by, by saying that anything Rasulullah did is about wahyu, it's about revelation. Revelation is only meant uh, for Al-Quran. But when it comes to his statement, uh, his, uh, what, uh, his act, so all of that is a manifestation of himself being influenced by the wahyu, by the Al-Quran. So that's why uh, we cannot just turn to the prophetic decision only at the level of apparent action, meaning that you have something like Ron. Sometimes when it comes to like the influence of modern element, we start to become like Zon, start to think again and start to become skeptical about some of his statement. So we don't we cannot be in that uh, manner. When it comes to Rasulullah, we have to have a proper iman. We have to really believe about him. Okay, uh, it is not uh, the level uh, that I mentioned just now at the apparent level, meaning that we sometimes we feel discontent about what he said, and because of this modern influence, there are so many uh, things that keep on influencing us. Sometimes we start to become like asking ourselves whether what Rasulullah did or what Rasulullah said is true or not. So it's something like discontent. You know, start to feel that, meaning that you are not really certain about him. Okay, and uh, it is uh, it shows that you are not really certain about him before, not just now. It shows that before you are not not really believe about him. You are because when you talk about belief. You have to to accept him and to recognize him at the le at the level of al muliyakin at least. Okay, um, not uh, when we talk about yakin, there is no possibility that you will come again to uh, non yakin or to doubt or to or to zan. Okay, there is no possibility that you uh, going down again to that level when you thing or your when you feel that you are already yakin you will be yakin all the time when you start to feel uh, like discontent or start to question about something regarding Rasulullah meaning you are not really yakin before uh, that is the um, the right things that happen to you so when we talk about the prophetic tradition we all of us know this prophetic tradition is the very foundation of Islam, which has been firmly established for the last 14 centuries. Okay, for the last 14 centuries, uh, this is one of the major sources when it comes to knowledge. And it is the second after Al Quran. What happens if we ignore the prophetic tradition? If we ignore the prophetic tradition as a main source of knowledge, we will tend to reduce Islam to just a set of common general principle. And when we define Islam, we tend to define Islam through our own whim, uh, through our own imagination, or through our own conception. And that's what's going to be happen if we ignore the prophetic tradition. And if we ignore the prophetic tradition also, 
it may entice us into a misguided way of thinking. So in order to have a proper way of thinking, we have to always uh, uh, hold to the prophetic tradition and, and treat the prophetic tradition as the main, one of the main sources of knowledge. And then uh, if we are not embrace the prophetic tradition as the source of knowledge, we can be easily influenced by, by the modern thought which could bring disastrous effects over our mind and over our practice. That's what going to happen if we forget or ignore the prophetic tradition, especially now when we see that most of the Muslims are simply being influenced by the Western doctrine or by the Western ideas. It shows that we are already started to neglect the prophetic tradition. Otherwise, we are not being easily influenced by the Western doctrines, Western secular doctrines. And if we neglect the prophetic tradition also, we, it will make us entirely devoid of one of the major sources of the essential knowledge because from the prophetic tradition, it can enable us to explain properly about Islam. We can't be able to explain properly about Islam if we start to neglect the prophetic religion, the Sunnah. And it will lead us to a deeper interpretation of Al-Quran. If we want to really know about Al-Quran, the, the in-depth meaning of Al-Quran, you have to go through the prophetic tradition. And uh, the prophetic tradition also can make, can or can enlighten us about what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan. And prophetic tradition be, uh, beside Al-Quran, it becomes the solid grounding in order for us to understand the major key concept in Islam. Yes, some of the major key concepts in Islam can be explained through the prophetic tradition. And through the prophetic tradition also, we can really know our own history. And we can think based on a true right logic. Because we have to think everything logically, but it is not any kind of logic. That logic must be based on the prophetic tradition. Because prophetic tradition, um, one of the elements that consists in the prophetic tradition is the philosophical principle of Islam. So that pre uh, philosophical principle of Islam uh, contain what, what we uh, name by logic. So in philosophical, uh, philosophical principle of Islam, it teach us about true logic. Because it is very dangerous if you not know the right true logic. Because if you don't know about the right true logic and if you neglect the prophetic tradition that leads you to understand about the main principle underpinning logical thinking, so we will start to evaluate everything based on our imagination. And we start to think that what is fiction is actually true. And that's what will to be happen if we start to neglect the prophetic, the prophetic tradition because in prophetic tradition, it can make us understand about one of the most important aspects, which is about the principle, the Islamic principle, philosophical principle. That's what you're going to, to understand when we become close or familiar with the prophetic tradition. If we are not um, all to the prophetic tradition properly, we cannot know the philosophical principle of Islam, which is needed in order to, for us to think something logically in the right way. And if we look at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I think uh, in every kitab that mentioned about him, from before 
uh, in the past until today, we come to know that he is the most perfect being, Al Insan Al Kamel, the perfect man, Al Insan Al Kamel. And we also know that he is singular in his nature. None other human being having the same nature with him, even among the prophet also, did not share the same nature with him. It's the, he is transcend uh, all of the prophets. He is more than uh, all of the prophets, meaning that he is singular in his nature, even though he is among the Onlul Azmi, the five major prophet, but he is uh, the most highest one. And he, he ultimately, he cannot compete with other prophets. He is more than other prophets. That's why I mentioned here that he is singular in his nature. Uh, because why? Because he is the seal of the prophets. Qatamul Anbiya, Iwal Mursalim. And the most interesting thing is that his prophethood was already established when Adam was between water and clay. Meaning that Adam is still not fully formed. But Rasulullah Wasallam is already a prophet. And that's very interesting about, about the prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Then we're going to explain that later. And when we see at Prophet Wasallam. He is a manifestation of metaphysical unity and infused with metaphysical meaning. So, so that's why uh, every time when he mentioned about something, when he did something, it is not just related with the physical realm. Everything ultimately relates to the metaphysical realm because he is a manifestation of metaphysical unity because he is the one who first appeared at the level of wahda after Adiyah. There are, there are levels of God's manifestation. And the first manifestation of God happened at the level of Ahadiyah. And the, at the level of Ahadiyah, the first creation who appeared at the level is Haqiqah. Muhammadiyah. So that's why when he appears in this world, he is a manifestation of that metaphysical unity. Okay? He is a manifestation of that metaphysical uh, unity. But it is not just that manifestation, but uh, what infused in him is the metaphysical meaning. So don't think that what he said is just got to do with the singular matter or uh, just got to do with the physical realm. For example, we take the hadith, watan min al -iman. Don't think that watan there is about this, this state, Malaysia, Singapore, Canada, <laughs> or America. Don't think that that hadith is about that. You know, The watan is about your true self before you come here. That is your, your watan, the real watan, nafsun natiqa. So that's why Hubul Watan, because man is kingdom in miniature. So in us, uh, contain any reality that we can find in this world and in that world, in the metaphysical world. So that's why it is a kingdom in miniature, because it includes in it all of those realities, the realities of this physical world and the realities of the metaphysical world. So that's what it means by that hadith. But our politician, when he use that hadith, they think the, the, the nationalism, the patriotism, you know. Not, that is not kind of that, that kind of thing. Okay? So uh, that's what I mean, that we see certain hadith, we have to always see not in the context of this world, but also about something else, about the metaphysical aspect, the meta metaphysical Ram, because in him infused, he himself infused with metaphysical meaning. And what about his ontological status? He is one of the realities. Yeah? He is like, like the Bashariah is so like us. 
the flesh and blood is also like us. So that's why uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Am ana basharum mithlukum." In terms of flesh and blood, I'm the same with you. I'm the same in terms of the the human physical body, but not in terms of the insani aspect. I'm not. The same. I'm the highest one when it comes to the insani aspect. So that's why we have to know his ontological status. Regarding his ontological status, his ontological status situated him within an internal and a temporal dimension. Between that, one aspect relate to the eternal, one aspect relate to the temporal dimension, space and time dimension. But when he appear in this phenomenal world, he always transcend this phenomenal world. So whatever he did and whatever whatever he said is something transcend the phenomenal world, because that is his ontological status in between uh, eternal dimension and the temporal. Dimension, but at the same time, he always transcends the physical phenomena or the phenomenal world. Although he appear in time, uh, because when we talk about this world, it it it's about space time phenomena, you know, space time phenomena. But when he appear in this world in time. His appearance constitute an embodiment of the eternal, meaning that the element which relates with the origin of man, the element of alamul mulk. Okay, that element is the one uh, become a part of him. So when Uh, we talk about his appearance in time. His appearance in time constitute an embodiment of the eternal. And at the same time, also he is the real Khutub. Okay. Now people talk about uh, any 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 period of time, uh, there will be one Khutub. Okay. We call it Khutub Zaman. And I mentioned before that in our zaman, in our period, 20 years and. 21st century, our Qut Zaman is Syed Muhammad Naqib Al Atas. I have all the proof to say that. Okay, that is our Qut Zaman. Qut Zaman means that something like a mizan, a wazan, you know, a way that that make everything balance and in instead of equilibrium. That what you mean by Qut Zaman. And but when we talk about Rukhlah, he is the The kutub of all kutub. He is a real kutub, round which the whole of creation revolve, and through which it is sustained. That's why when Rasulullah came here, Rasulullah Sallam came here, everything become happy. Everything become happy because they know that. This as this is a person that going to sustain the cosmological order of this whole universe. Okay, he do not destroy. He he will become justice to not to just to mankind, but he also did justice to three kingdoms of this physical world: the kingdom of vegetative, the animal kingdom, and the mineral kingdom. All of them can can sustain and can always be in the state of cosmos when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appear in this world. So that's why we have to always try the best in order to inherit his tradition and to make sure that his tradition is is being taught in all leaders so that. They when do something, 
they do something out of that tradition and because of they do something out of that tradition they can sustain and maintain the cosmological order of this universe and then at the same time also rasulullah sallallahu is a mazhar of absolute being the mazhar of al haq what does it mean it means that divine truth embodied and personified in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's why we said that he is a mazhar of the absolute being because of that he have a, a very uh, higher level of, of uh, character a good character excellent in terms of his character and beauty in terms of his form his more uh, his even beauty than the prophet yusuf alaihi uh, salam is the most beauty in terms of form and the most excellent in terms of character that's why rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is preferred over all the rest of god's many prophets who preceded him and what bestowed upon him is all kind of virtues and all kind of bounty from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, he is both the opener and the closer so uh, his function as both the opener and the closer these are qualities that none of the prophet share with him the we we know just now that he is the one who appear the first he the first creation so what does it mean by he is the opener he is the opener since he was created as light before all thing that's why uh, uh, in some of the sufi literature uh, it is mentioned about the nur muhammad he is the opener because he was created as light before all things what about he is the closer he is the closer because his human mission came last in the historical series of prophets because of that he is the khatamul anbiya he is the closer that's why he uh, in one of his hadith he mentioned that verily i was the first among the prophet to be created and the last to be deputed uh, that is uh, one of the hadith regarding himself and of course uh, uh, he is the intercessor the uh, in bil mamri shafa'ah when god gathers all souls to divide them in judgment finally and ultimately all of them all of the soul will turn to him to get the shafa'ah so that's why i think there there is one good dua uh, teach by professor uh, atas to me allahumma atina اللهم آتي محمد الوسيلة والفضيلة والشرف والدرجة العالية الرفيعة وارزقنا الشفاعة. ده is very good دعاء. Prophet, I think last year he he mentioned that دعاء to me and asked me to always practice the دعاء in order for us to get the شفاعة from Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم because finally and ultimately when it come to the shafa'ah when god gathers all souls to divide them in judgment all of them will turn to him in order to get the shafa'ah and another thing about rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is is that he provide us with convincing and satisfying answers regarding uh, our life regarding the most important question about our life especially uh, for example what is your purpose what is the purpose of life why do you come here where you are going to 
what is your final destination? Uh, these are all kind of answers that could only be answered by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he spreads a light of truth. Without this light of truth, the universe, the universe will always be in a state of darkness. And beings become alien to each other and always hostile to each other. So that's why we, what we can see now happen among human beings. Why we become hostile now to one another, even among the Muslims. We, we become hostile to one another. And one Muslim with another Muslim become something like an alien to us, you know. Because it shows that we are far from the light of Prophet. You are far from that light. You are far from him. We do not even feel his presence. We, we should feel his presence, but because we don't uh, get to that light, because he already spread his light, and that light is a light of truth. Because just now we mentioned that without that light, uh, our life always become in a state of darkness, and we become like uh, one to another, become like an enemy. There is no such thing that we call the brotherhood. The brotherhood comes from the light of prophecy. If we endure the light of prophecy, there will be again the brotherhood in Islam. But if we ignore the light, they will know a brotherhood. That's why Muslims start to fight to each other, quarrel to each other, even on the small, small thing. Okay? That's why we, we can see that all major prophets know about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Ibrahim, the Prophet Adam, the Prophet Noah. Even one interesting hadith about the Prophet Noah. Uh, one day, uh, the Jibril came to him and asked him whether he, he, telling, uh, he conveyed the message to his people. He said that, yes, indeed, I did convey message uh, to my people. So after that, the Jibril went to see his people. And Jibril asked his people whether the Prophet no came to them to convey the message. The answer is no. <laughs> so the Jibril went again to see Prophet no. And at that time, the Jibril asked, uh, he mentioned uh, the answer of uh, Prophet Noah's people. He, he said that your people said that you didn't, you didn't even convey the message to them. So in this case, who do you think going to be your witness? So the answer is very, very interesting. He said, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So just imagine, he is the most ancient prophet. And about the prophet Noah, he is being known as the second Adam. Okay? He is being known as the second Adam. Even at his time, I think about 6,000 years ago, 6, 000, from our time, 6,000 6, something years ago, he already know about prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even he said that, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going to be my witness. And that is very interesting about that hadith. And then, who else mentioned about Prophet so the name Muhammad? The Prophet Adam, one of the hadith narrated by Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, okay? the Prophet Adam saw the name Muhammad on the throne. The Arash. Uh, uh, when he start to ask forgiveness from God, and it is in the midst of asking forgiveness, he mentioned the name Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Allah asked him, "How do you know the name?" <laughs> so he, he answered that I saw the name behind the arash. Yeah, and that's very interesting, and that's why this kind of hadith okay, make us understand why. Allah gave command to Rasulullah Sallam to say, "What is Allah command to Rasulullah Sallam?" 
Allah komen Rasulullah SAW itu say, Wa ana awalul muslimin. I'm the first among the muslim. I'm the first who became the muslim. What does it mean? It means that as what Professor Al-Atas used to, to say, he is the first Muslim chronology, chronologically. It is not just at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu appear in the Arab land, Arabia, in the Arabia. It is not just that. Okay? It means that he is the first Muslim chronologically. It shows that he is even already a Muslim before the Prophet Adam alayhi salam. So that's why he is not just the first Muslim of Arabia. So that that what it mean based on uh, the the story that we can find in the hadith regarding Rasulullah sallallahu especially when Prophet Adam alayhi salam mentioned his name. Because of that also we know that he before he existed in person, his reality is already there in somewhere in God's mind. Okay? His reality is already there. The hakikat of Muhammad is already there, even before any creation. And then uh, another prophet who anticipated Rasulullah is the prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. He already anticipated Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the, the, the event that shows that he anticipated Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Through his prayer. Through his uh, prayer, he said, This Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is my descendant who will not involve in shirik. And he will come to read the kalimah. Okay, uh, that is the ayah. You can see and you can refer to the, that, that ayah regarding the prayer of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam that indicate the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam and the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam having a very close connection. And in this case also, uh, uh, in in uh, one of the hadiths we can find in the collection of Al Bukhari, uh, the hadith that we mentioned just now, I was a prophet when Adam was between water and clay. So that's why I think what we can think about that hadith when Rasulullah said, I was a prophet when Adam was between water and clay. It shows that it is wrong to think that he just become the prophet at the age of 46. He's already the prophet. <laughs> so sometimes we say that he just become the, the prophet at the age of 46. So what is the right way to mention about that? The right way to mention about that is that he declared his prophethood in the body at the age of 40. And not 40, at the age of 40. So we cannot say that he became the prophet at the age of 40. He already the prophet before he came in this world. Okay? So what we should say is that he declared, now he declared his prophethood. Before he was already the, the prophet, now at the age of 40, he start to declare his prophethood when he arrived at the age of 40. Okay? So that's why um, sometimes we are wrong in this kind of thing because we not really know what had happened when it comes to Rasulullah Islam about his nature of prophecy. And just now I mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam having a very close connection with the Prophet Ibrahim alaihi salam, although uh, the difference is about four four thousand years from uh, Prophet Ibrahim, uh, 
uh, up to the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam. So, what indicate that close relation? The doa iftitah. Doa iftitah started by Prophet Ibrahim alaihi salam. The first part, according to the uh, to uh, Professor Latan, this the first part started by Prophet Ibrahim alaihi salam and the rest completed by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so you have to 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 look again at uh, uh, Prophet Al-Tas uh, recent book about the mithaq mentioning about the first and the second part of the dua iftitah which part that being completed by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and which part which is started by the Prophet Ibrahim alaihi salam so we know that Rasulullah is the universal prophet. That's why he is the Rahmatun Lil Alamin. Because he is the universal, the universal prophet. And he is the only prophet authorized to establish law or to formulate law. So that's why he record all laws brought by the prophet before him and he make that perfect. And he is even being mentioned in Al Quran stronger than the mountain. Which ayah that mentioned about he is stronger than the mountain? The ayah that we can find in the first part of the Ratib Al Atas. Lau anzalna hadha al Quran ala jabal la ruaitahu khasham mutasadiyam min khasiyatillah. If the Al Quran being sent to the mountain, the mountain will be split asunder. But when it comes to Rasulullah, being revealed to Rasulullah, it is nothing. Yeah? It's not like the mountain. Rasulullah can hold the, the, the trust of that revelation. You know, I think the, the mountain can hold the trust. They, they know that they don't have the ability and the faculty in order to, to hold the trust. You know? So that's why they, if Allah said, if this Al-Quran being revealed to the mountain, it will be split asunder. So, that ayat shows that he is stronger than mountain. That's why he received revelation continuously for about how many years? For 23 years, he continuously received, not like other prophets. Other prophets, sometimes they receive, sometimes they are not. It is not something continuously. But when it comes to Prophet Sallallahu he continuously receives revelation. So that's why it shows that he is superlative kind of character. So that's why he can be in that state, can receive continuously the revelation. And when it comes to other prophet, God uh, from the, all the verses regarding other prophet, <coughs> When it comes to certain command, Allah will say to them, Aslim. But what happened to the Rasulullah? When it comes to Rasulullah, God will say, Iqra. There is totally two different, significant difference between the command Aslim and the command Iqra. The first ayah being revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu is with the command Iqra' Bismi Rabbika Lazi Khalaq It's not Aslim okay? Because first he's going to receive Islam and Islam is commensurate with his quality as the Universal Prophet As Universal Prophet he is going to receive the universal, the universal religion. And the name for that universal religion is Islam. Okay. Is Islam. So that when he about to receive Islam, which is the universal religion, he know that this Islam requires a great deal of knowledge. So, Islam is not just something got to do with submission. Even Islam is the principle and the standard for submission. Okay? 
we cannot just submit without following Islam. So that in that case, Islam is the principle and the standard when it relates to submission. Only the form of submission that comes from Islam is being accepted. So that's why Islam brings the standard and become the principle of submission. And in order to know Islam, because Islam now is not like other religion, Deen al Qayyim, which is meant only for a small group, only for a specific tribe. Okay? Now Islam is for whole mankind. So, by looking at Islam as the religion to the whole mankind, so he come to understand that Islam is the universal religion. So therefore, it requires a great deal of knowledge. If we submit to Islam without true knowledge, it is not really true submission. So that's why knowledge is very important when it comes to Islam. Muslim wa Muslimah. So submission without knowledge is not really true submission. So that's why the, the, the command to Rasulullah now is not anymore like what has been commanded to the Prophet of the past, Aslim. When it comes to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the command is Iqra. Bismi rabbika allazi khalaq qalaqal insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbukal akramul ladhi anna babil qalam. Okay. Uh, that is, uh, that al-qalam also relate to the hadith qudsi awaluma qalaqallahu al-qalam. Al-qalam relate to the intellect of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Al-Qalam also relate to the, 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 his reality, relate to his reality, Nur Muhammad or Haqiqah Muhammadiyah. That Al-Qalam relate to that. And uh, Prophet Wasallam is for the whole Bani Adam. That's why sometimes he is being called Sirajan Muniro. Sometimes he is being called Ashraful Ambiya Iwal Mursalin because he's man for the whole Bani Adam. And then uh, the famous one, Rahmatun Lil Alamin. What is another element that relates with Rasulullah? Uswatun Hasana. Kulukun Azim. And that is uh, what we know about Rasulullah Sallallahu when we know that he is man for the whole Bani Adam. So in this case, Tawhid has not really complete. If we have a wrong idea about the Prophet Wasallam, Because why? Because he is the one who really actualized Tawhid in the most complete way. Not other Prophet. Other prophets also do something that relate, relate with Tawhid. But when it comes to the Prophet Wasallam, he is the one who really actualized Tawhid in the most complete way. And that Tawhid is being the, the, the most actualized, the, the most perfect actualization of Tawhid can be seen in Islam. So that's why there is no other religion that being accepted by God, accept Islam. So that's why a religion of Islam cannot be without Rasulullah become part of the formula of the Shahada. So that's why when we profess Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, it must come immediately after that, wa Ashadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Because religion of Islam cannot be without him become a part of that formula, the formula of the shahada. Or in another word, we can't take the formula without Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That formula is not really a formula. 
without Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in it. Even without him, we can reflect that formula. Let's say if we being exposed to that formula, but without Muhammad, without us being exposed or being introduced or recognized Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it means that as a consequence of that, we can reflect the uh, properly. That shahada, that formula, and by looking his name Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Muhammad, the name Muhammad itself is miracle, and that name shows that he is the most perfect man, even in an earlier time. That's why we found the ayat, the verse warafana laka dikra. This alam nashrah na. Alam nashroh laka sadrak wa rafa'na laka zikrak. So he's become even the most perfect man or human being even in an earlier time before any other creation. Only his creation. So that's why when we see that formula, the formula of shahada, la ilaha illallah is iman pat. It's about the truth. What about Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? La ilaha illallah. We said just now is iman part. It's about the truth. About the truth. Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad Rasulullah is Islam part. What does it implies when we say that it is Islam part? Islam part implies. Tasdik part that shows that only Rasulullah can can bring tasdik, can acknowledge properly Allah through Islam. Okay, that because Muhammadur Rasulullah is Islam part and also the tasdik part. That's why he is the only one who can make what is valid and what is invalid. And he is the only one that can make us know what ought to do and what not to do. So only Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's that. That's why the formula must be perfect. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Because just now we we know that he's the most perfect man, and because of of that he is the most perfect man. He is the only one that due to this kind of religion, Islam, Al Islam, because Al Islam is the universal religion for mankind. So that's why it need to be brought by the perfect man, and the perfect man is also at the same time the universal man. Okay, and because of that, he is being raised before another being being raised. And just now we also mentioned that he is already Muslim from before at the level of Hakikah Muhammadiyah at the level of in Sufi we mentioned just now at the level of Wahda after the Ahadiyah and even the essence of all prophethood was always present in that first creation. That's why all the prophets know about the coming of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because their essence is always in that hakikat, present in that hakikat, always present in that first creation, hakikah Muhammadiyah. So that's why you cannot just say anything about Rasulullah without knowledge because Allah warned us, "Sanak tu buma kalu." I will take not what you say about Rasulullah. Allah will take not everything but what you said about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you have to be very careful not to become insolent, because now we we are insolent because we are so preoccupied with social change and. At the same time, we neglect the teaching of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We accuse him for 
of so many kind of thing. You know? and we start to to say about something uh, out of our ignorance. So that's why we have to to take note about what Allah want us. He's going to take note of anything that we say about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because now we start to neglect Rasulullah because we think society is greater than Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We give priority to the society. And we don't know that. We don't know that by brings or elevate society to the level of knowledge, gradually the society will leave us into will leave us to ruin because the society always think that they have right to change the word. They have right to to modify the meaning that come from the prophetic tradition. They have right to <coughs> to modify the meaning of Al-Qur'an. They have right to redefine in according to what they want. That is society. They think that they can project the worldview. Okay? And that is the society. And because of that, if you depend solely on the society, it will leave you to ruin. Because why? Because they reduce and define everything within the secular outlook. They don't care about what will come after this. They will misguide us. And what they only follow is conjecture and desire. Wrong. Okay? So that's why we have to understand that society is actually, they are not they, they cannot think. The individual is the one who thinks. It's not the society. So the most perfect individual who can think properly is Muhammad Wasallam. So instead of following the society, why not you following Muhammad Wasallam and try to understand his uh, tradition, his sunnah. Because why? Only through Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know our religion and civilization. And through Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know what is not our religion and what is not our civilization. Sometimes we become confused. We think that Western civilization is, must be our civilization. <laughs> it's very simple now. So the, the, the example is very clear now. I think most of the Muslims now think that the Western civilization must be our civilization. We must imitate the Western civilization. But they don't know that what it means by Islamic civilization and what is the region that, the only region that accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, uh, the only thing that we can we can know about that is to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And by following Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we do not become a slave of natural sciences. Because now we become a slave to the physical and natural sciences. And because because we, when we start to neglect Rasulullah, we become become a slave of that. We become a slave of secular civilization and the secular worldview. And uh, uh, something more about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. First uh, premise is that his spirit is before Adam Alayhi Salam. Uh, that is the first premise. His spirit is before Adam. And what conclusion that we or can make from that premise? What do you think the conclusion that we can make based on that premise? His spirit is before Adam. It means that he is not really a descendant of Adam. <laughs> that is the conclusion. That is the proposition. What is the proof? The proof is what being reported by Ibn Abbas. Radiallahu anhu in 
Nihayatul Arab fi funun al-adab. One of the report by Ibn Abbas, he said, uh, he reported about the saying of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, I'm the first cast in Adam. Although Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being created, the spirit also being created, but the spirit is the first creation. The spirit is the first creation. So that's why he is not really a descendant of Adam. Okay. We are the descendant of Adam, Bani Adam. But when it comes to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's not really so. Because he is the he is the first. He is the first creation. And the, the, the idea, the Hakikah Muhammadiyah, is the idea about the Prophet. It's already there in God's mind. Before Adam alaihi salam. The idea is already there. The idea of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Although we know about this kind of thing, we are not confused about Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Confused in terms of what? We are not worship him. We are not thinking him as an idol. So that's why we have to to not to start uh, uh, to stop. We have to stop using. Love. The Malay word idola. He is not the idol. You know? We are not worshiping him. Although we know he is a great person, the pipe, the, the, the first creation, but we are, uh, he is still uh, not share with Allah in terms of tawhid. He is just share with Allah in terms of obedience. We have to, when we want to obey Allah, we have to also obey Rasulullah. Um, by knowing that we are not worship him, but we also know he is our parent spiritually, because Allah mentioned in one of his verse, "Aula bil mu'minina bi amfusihim." Is more than our uh, ourself. He is more than our parent. He is really our parent. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. Really, our parents spiritually. So, when it comes to dilemma between um, following the the parent, when the parent asks us to do something which contradict with the prophetic tradition, which one that we're going to follow? We follow Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he is our he is our parent spiritually. He is our spiritual parent. Okay, this is only the Biological parent. So the spiritual parent is more superior than the biological parent. And at the same time also, we understand that he has been given hikmah. What is hikmah? Hikmah is knowledge of reality of thing and knowledge of reality of action. That conform to that reality, okay. that what has been given by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Knowledge of reality of things and action that conform to that reality. Both. It is not knowledge about reality, but knowledge about the action. Which action? That's why Rasulullah always pray, Allahumma arinil ashya'a kama hiya. Not just about to show the reality of thing. But also to show the the right action that conform to that reality, because sometimes we recognize we recognize the reality of thing, but we act not in according to that reality. That it also shows that we are still in the uh, uh, in the state of ignorance. Okay, it shows that we just recognize, but we don't know how to acknowledge that. But when it comes to Rasulullah. He has been given both the knowledge of reality of thing and the knowledge of actions that conform to that reality. And only Rasulullah is the one who put hikmah into practice. And the silsilah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what? The silsilah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Hanif. So there is no question about the mother, the father, whether going to the hell or not, because the silsilah of the prophet is Hanif. 
That is his silsila. Okay? And for 23 years, amazingly, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used new Quranic Arabic language without doing any mistake. Always use it rightly and properly for 23 years after revelation and, and until the completion of his mission, until the Hajjatul Wida. You know? He used the Arabic Quranic language without doing any mistake. Okay? What happened to us? <laughs> you always make a mistake when it comes to the using of the Quranic Arabic language. <laughs> but not Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in order to return, we must follow the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because his psychology is influenced by Al-Quran. Not his psychology influenced Al-Quran. His psychology is the one who influenced by Al-Quran. So that's why when we talk about Ar-Raj'i, because Ad-Din is about ar about returning, to return back to the real, true self. That is Ad-Din, which is being called Al-Islam. So Al-Islam, the essential element of Al-Islam is to make ourselves return to the real, true self. How to do that? How to return? So the answer is very easy. In order to return, we have to follow the example of Rasulullah Wasallam, And that's why we have to nurture the love to the Prophet Wasallam. How to nurture the love to the Prophet? At least we have to follow some of things said by him, which is relevant to us. Okay. Try the best in order to, to, to do something that he said, which is relevant to us, relevant to our ability, relevant to our power, relevant to our intellect. Okay. If we come to a certain level of intellect, try to see something that we can do out of his sunnah. Don't make your intellect higher, but when it comes to the, the, the sunnah, it is lower. It's not commensurate with your level of intellect. Make sure when you are, your intellect is already at a certain level, you have to acquire or to, to, uh, to follow more of his sunnah. Because now you have an ability, your intellectual ability to do that. And... When we mention about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we always have to have consciousness. You have to always have conscious. Because sometimes we just mention him, but we don't have something like a right spiritual mood. We mention the name, but the right, the, the spirit, the right spiritual mood is not there. It's something like, like, the, the feeling is not commensurate with that great name, you know. As if the name is something like nothing to you. Okay, you mention Muhammad, but your feeling is nothing. You know? So that's why you have to have conscious, to have, you also have to have a right spiritual mood when you talk about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to always remind people about what the Prophet said as if we just heard him say about that. That's what we have to do. Well, that is the spiritual mood, the conscious that we have to have. Okay? The feeling that we have. We, we always have to remind people about his sunnah. As if he, Rasulullah just mentioned to us yesterday. Something like that. you know. And we have to talk more about him. As if he is still around. That's why we, when we want to uh, um, recite Al-Fatihah to Rasulullah, we said, what, what do we say? Ila hadratin Nabi. We invite his presence. Ila hadratin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is not ila ruh. Uh, we say ila hadratin Nabi. So it's something that we invite. Please come to us. Become our governance to govern us. 
So he, he his spirit, his soul can be can come and govern us. So even now when he talk about him, he he still he will be around us. You know, he can feel that. You know? And it is something wrong with our Islam, with our Muslim, uh, Islam. For the Muslim now, is something wrong with our Islam. If we don't say very much about Rasulullah. Okay. We, we mention about so many things, but we do not even have a time to mention about Rasulullah Wasallam. That shows there is something wrong about your Islam. You said that you will submit to Islam, but your submission without you conscious about Rasulullah Wasallam, but you mention about him, about him always, it shows that you just become your submission is just unwilling kind of submission. It's not really true submission. And then what makes Rasulullah different with other prophets also is that he brought what does he brought? He brought Ummah Muslim, Ummatan Musliman. The Ummah. Not just small group or not, not just specific tribe like Bani Israel. He lead the Ummah. Okay, he lead the Ummah. That's why Allah designated him as Khatamul Abdiya. And at the same time also, another designation of Rasulullah is what? Khatamul Quran. The seal of revelation. There is no other revelation after this, after him. What will come after him is a manifestation of that revelation. The ilham to the awliya. It's not anymore Al-Quran. It's not anymore because Al-Quran is only meant for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he is the Khatamul Quran. Okay, the seal of the revelation. So of course after that, there will be no more revelation. But what going to be there after Al-Quran is the insight of the awliya. And that insight is a manifestation of the revelation. So that's why we have to also take note and to, 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 to always uh, uh, give a proper consideration to any knowledge that comes from our awliya. Because it contains in it an element of revelation. Because of that, it becomes a part of insight or ilham. And the most interesting thing about Rasulullah is that he could witness the continual activity of recreation. He can witness that always. That's why one particular ayat meant for that kind of nature in him is that Ma kazabal fu'adu ma ro'a. He always see the truth. We always see that phenomena, the continual activity of recreation. So it means that he always witness God's activity. And because of that, is it, it is possible also for him to see who Allah is. So that's why uh, only Rasulullah SAW uh, being authorized by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to formulate the law which we call the Sharia, because the whole of the prophetic tradition constituting Sharia. And when you talk about the Sharia of Muhammad Wasallam, it encompasses what? The theological, metaphysical, philosophical, and ethical principle of the religion of Islam and the worldview projected by it and when we talk about the Sharia, it is the greatest and the most upright of all laws. So that's why we cannot say that constitution is higher than Sharia. It is a kind of kufur when you say that. Okay? It is really kufur when you say that constitution is higher than Sharia. Because Sharia is the greatest of all laws, the most upright of all laws. No other loss can be compared to the Sharia of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because he is the perfect man. When he, form he formulated the law, 
which is called Sharia. He is being authorized not by just the, 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 the head of the state. He is being authorized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why his Sharia is the most upright one, the most superior and the most supreme. And because of that, it is meant for the benefit of all mankind. Now and in future. Not just now, not just before, but in future also. And its benefits also can be, uh, can be uh, taste, can be experienced by the animal kingdom, by the vegetative kingdom, and the mineral kingdom. So that's why it's important to, to uphold the Sharia. Okay? Because when we start to implement Sharia, uh, we, we implement Sharia meaning that we, we, in, we, we bring our life into all kinds of elements that relate with Sharia. The philosophy, the moral aspect, the theological aspect, the ethical aspect, everything is based on the prophetic tradition. And when we start to base on that, to the Sharia, so the, the benefit is just not for mankind, but to all of this physical kingdom, this three physical kingdom. And then we have to know that the rules of the Sharia is based on Hikam, Hikam, aphorism. And based on based upon causes, and that causes and that he come entail the universal goodness and benefit both society and individual, and that and and the same time also the rule of the Sharia intended for the absolute ultimate end, and this absolute and ultimate end is something that can make you make ourselves pure and getting the full measure of God's blessing the ni'mah if we so that's why we have to examine thoroughly the prophet words the prophet acts the prophet disposition which constitute the sharia okay that is the the, the aspect that constitute the sharia his word, his acts, and his disposition. Because we, why we have to examine that thoroughly? Because they provide us with certain specific contact that show different kind of intent. Not, not, uh, not uh, uh, every of his act are the same. Okay? Every, every of his act shows different contacts and shows different intent. This is manifestation of his main attribute, the tablik. Okay? The, the Rasulullah has a four main attribute, Siddiq, Amanah, Tablik, and Fatana. And when you talk about uh, the Sharia, which include his word, his act, and his disposition, which provide us with certain specific contact and different con uh, different intent. This is a manifestation of his attribute of tablik. What is this tablik? Tablik is none other than to convey and to propagate of what was revealed to him in wider in a wider spectrum and at all levels of human intellect. And that is the Sharia. So the Sharia is not only meant for the people of the highest intellect, at all levels of intellect and in a wider spectrum. So that's why uh, every uh, of his act having a specific contact. You cannot use the contact to, to mean another contact. It's not the same. Okay? And it also shows a different intent. And all of this contact reflect his role as the Khatamul Ambiya. Okay, Khatamul Ambiya. And his role as the Ashraful Ambiya Iwal Mursalin. Because of this role, 
Khatamul Anbiya and the Ashraful Anbiya Iwal Mursalin. So he is at once the supreme imam, the most judicious judge, Qadi, the most learned jurist, Mufti, the leader of all leaders, the judge of all judges, the foremost scholars, foremost scholars of all scholars. Uh, this is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, he is man of everything. The 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 universal man. Okay, he is the universal man. This uh, the manifestation of himself as the perfect example. His capacity as public and his role as the conveyor of Ar-Risala because of that uh, three expect himself as the perfect example, his capacity as public and his role as the conveyor of Ar-Risala. So he can play his dynamic role. At the same time, he's not just the prophet, he's also the imam, he also the the judge, he also the mufti, he also the leader, something like that, you know, everything. So, what does it mean? It means that when we want to start doing something which is so essential and significant, we cannot act without thinking of him. <laughs> now, when we do so many things, we always forget about him. So, as a Muslim, Anything, even when we, especially when we involve in education, in politics, in economy, Rasulullah did not escape any kind of that thing. No? Anything of that thing is not escape him. He involved in all those essential elements that relate with human life. So when we want to do something which is so significant in human life, we cannot do without. <coughs> Always thinking about him, because his capacity is so meaningful, and his various meaningful capacities shows his nature as kuli. He is kuli in his nature, and because of that, it gives different significance in all contexts of his action, his statement, his disposition. Any of that will give a different significance. And that what we mean by the Sharia. Everything that he said, everything that he did, become binding to us as the general rule. Hukmun am in Arabic become the general rule to us. It is binding to us actually. It's not, not just binding now, but binding until when? Until the end of the world. <laughs> Until the end of the world. Because why? Because all of that general rule, Hukmun Am, influenced by the Wahy, by the revelation. So that's why, therefore, we should abide by his command. Okay? Uh, and it is duty bound to avoid anything that he prohibited. However, I think I, I need to take uh, more time to finish uh, our discussion about Rasulullah. However, we, we should understand that his dynamic qualities and capacities and the context of his command and his statement relate not just with his position as legislator, but relate with so other uh, with so many things, okay? Uh, because uh, when we see Rasulullah, he is not just legislator. He is not just in that position, not just in maqam tashrih. He is more than that. Some action of Rasulullah SAW are part of his natural disposition, khilqah which are not part of legislation and instruction. So that's why you have to differentiate. When we see the hadith, when we see the statement of Allah, when we see in the sirah the way of how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam act, 
Sometimes it is not just about legislation. Sometimes it is out of his natural disposition. And it is not part of an instruction. So that's why some of his conduct cannot become a ground for analogical reasoning for Qiyas. That's, that's why we have to really know the un underlying causes of his action and his statement. When we see hadith, we cannot just see hadith as that hadith. We have to know the, the underlying causes of his statement, of his action. Okay? And then not any of uh, his statement can become a ground for analogical reasoning. Let's say, for example, very simple example. When he mounted on a she-camel when he going on the pilgrimage, it cannot become a legis legislation for us. <laughs> it is just a part of his natural disposition as an Arab. You know? <laughs> to go to the jihad, he has to, to, um, to, to mount the she-camel <laughs> on, on when going on the pilgrimage. So at least there are uh, several different contacts of Rasulullah uh, as he regard to his statement and action. Uh, first of course, most of his action are being done or his statement are being said in the, in the context of legislation, tashri, we call it tashri. There are plenty of evidence that uh, he was authorized by God with the power of legislation. For example, what? Very simple example. Usalli kama ra'aytumuni usalli. That is legislation. You cannot do the salat by looking at others. You have to look at Rasulullah. Uh, you have to see the, the way of, uh, the, and the way is how being explained in the hadith, you know, in his tradition. That is the only authorized way in order to do the salat. Usalli kama Muni Usalli. And the same so he said that learn your ibadah from me. When uh, he said that in Hajatul Wida. And then uh, in the Hajatul Wida also, what did he say? He said that let those present inform those who are absent. So that word itself, that statement itself, shows that there is something got to do with legislation, with Tashrat, Tashrat aspect. So, some of his statement and his action are in the context of issuing fatwa. It's not legislation. It's just edict, you know, the fatwa. What is the example? The example is that on the way to, uh, if you see the sea, on the way to Hajjatul Lida, he stopped at Mina. And at Mina, uh, uh, there was a man came to him and asked, okay, he, he asked Rasulullah. When he asked, he asked in order for Rasulullah to give fatwa. Okay? To give edict, to issue edict, the fatwa. What did he ask? He asked. He said that I shave before sacrificing. What did Rasulullah answer? Rasulullah said, You can proceed sacrificing and don't worry. Don't worry. You, you, you proceed with sacrifice. Even though you you shave before you sacrifice, do the the, the sacrifice, you know? okay? And then there is another contact, the the one that I mentioned just now in the context of issuing fatwa. Uh, it is lesser than legislation. It's not anymore like uh, heavy like the tashri. But the the third one is in the context of adjudication. Although. The, the, his role as the judge, the prophet as the judge. So that's why uh, we can see some of the statement of adversary, like judge between us. So they would like Rasulullah to, to judge. To, to, uh, that is in the context of adjudication. You know? And Rasulullah also sometimes said, I will certainly judge between you. According to what God has revealed in His book, and when we see this fatwa and qada, this fatwa and qada, both involve 
a relationship between general legislative rule hukum tashyi' and the applied rule hukum tatbi'i if somebody learn uh, the usul fiqh they can know this okay and uh, the, the relationship between the general legislative rule and the applied rule the juz'i the particular and the uh, general one and what come after that combination after that relationship the hukum tashyi the general uh, legislative rule and the applied rule what come after it is a particular part of the original shariah rule because the original shariah rule is so dynamic you know so wide in its spectrum so it always apply uh, applicable in a very juzi element or juzi part you know so that's why when uh, somebody ask somebody ask not to give legislation but to give some advice like a fatwa you know or to 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 judge about something and to judge is not really to giving uh, to 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 involve legislation you know it's, so for example prohibition on depositing raising juice in jars vanish in green uh, this is a case that happened at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when rasulullah prohibited that this prohibition imposed not because of its a general it involve a general legislative rule but the, the this prohibition imposed because of certain external factor okay certain external factor so the a ban is not about putting raising juice in a varnish container it is not about that <laughs> the ban is not about that no so there is some external factor that involved in that so uh, this is one of the case that uh, that involve himself as the one who giving the fatwa or to judge about something so sometimes he uh, his statement and his act is are in the context of himself as political leaders in the context of imara the political leadership of the state so that's why some of that instances cannot be confused as proscriptive legislation which entails an absolute prohibition because sometimes it is just uh, case by case thing you know based on a particular case or uh, something got to do with the leadership of the state so it is not meant for proscriptive legislation because when you talk about proscriptive legislation it involve or it entails an absolute prohibition so sometimes uh, when rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibited something it is not something absolute okay there is a context in that so uh, another what is another context another context is the context of giving guidance and we have to know that guidance is more than more general than legislation and giving guidance because of it is more general it is not intend to be decisive legislation is decisive but uh, guidance is not really decisive not intend to be decisive just to indicate that there are several ways towards achieving goodness and righteousness only that so sometimes rasulullah in his act and his statement all of that men giving guidance okay not as legislation so the the intent also different from legislation the intent in the context of giving guidance is in order to invite people to hold on good morality or to mostly involved in recommended matters and 
Another context is the context of conciliation. In Arabic, suluh, sad, lam, ha, suluh. Especially when it involves dispute between two parties. Okay? So, the statement or the act involves conciliation. Conciliation. Uh, when it comes to involve dispute. Let's say, for example, uh, in Sirah, the case of Ka'ab ibn Malik demanded repayment of debt from Abdullah ibn Abi Hadra. There is a case happened before at the time of Rasulullah And that dispute or quarrel happened inside the mosque. They quarrel inside the mosque. In the mosque. And the, the great, gradually, their, their voice become louder and louder and louder. And Rasulullah came and he made a gesture. Gesture something like. So that gesture means that it is intending. Uh, he, 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 uh, it is something, a gesture in order to bring conciliation. So that gesture as if something intending to say, deduct half of the, of the debt to come. Uh, did that? It's nothing like uh, like that. This uh, he showed the guest. Uh, in that, uh, did that the half of the debt? Don't quarrel anymore, <laughs> uh, because he not be able to uh, to pay uh, the full amount of that debt. So please just uh, ask him or request only half of that. So after that, come agreed to do that. <laughs> so there is a constant. The, the statement is not something. Uh, applied to everybody, just based on that case. Okay? So, sometimes the contact is to giving advice because there is always someone came to see Rostrov to ask his opinion, his advice. So, uh, for example, there is one case, the Rasul, uh, uh, one case when Rasulullah giving advice to Sayyidina Omar not to buy a horse that he already gave to someone as a gift. So suddenly Sayyidina Omar Al-Khattab want to buy again that, that horse after he gave that as a gift. Okay? Rasulullah advised him what, did, uh, the, the ad, what, what is the advice? He advised Sayyidina Omar not to buy even that person want to sell it for one dirham. Rasulullah advised him not to buy. Even he offered only one dirham for, for Sayyidina Umar to get back the horse. Okay? Because why? Rasulullah uh, said, someone who takes back his sadaqah is like a dog swallowing its own vomit. <laughs> uh, that's what Rasulullah said. Something like giving advice, no? So um, that shows that uh, that prohibition is not something uh, applica applicable for public. It is only meant for Sayyidina Omar. You know? It is not something public. This is uh, this kind of thing should be understood as interdiction, which meant to absorb. So there, there is something like uh, we said uh, we you know the word you know the word nahi nun ha ya. There are two kind of nahi nah you tanzi. Okay, the interdiction which meant to absorb. Okay, nah you tanzi. And there is another one that being called nah you tahrim. Implying absolute unlawfulness. So, uh, in that case, let's say, when Sayyidina Omar, let's say, he did not want to follow the advice of Allah, he still want to buy. The process of buying is valid. <laughs> so, it is not nahi tahrim. Okay? It is only nahi tanzi in order to purify yourself. Okay? Purify your akhlaq. You know? That kind of prohibition. It's not absolute kind of prohibition. Just a statement in order to say that if you do this, 
your your personality will be higher and elevated to a certain level. But it doesn't matter if you don't want to eat that bus, you want to still want to buy that, but you're not going to, your personality is not going to that level. That's all. <laughs> so that is something like Nahyu Nahi Tanzi. It's not Nahi Tahrim. Okay? Uh, today I don't have the whiteboard. <laughs> and then uh, there is some hadith. Because now I, I, I receive every day, I think from two years ago, uh, 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 in the midst of COVID, I always receive one day, one hadith, you know. Sometimes <laughs> uh, there are pros and cons, you know. You have to know the context, you know. Sometimes you, 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 you post certain hadiths, but you don't really know the context of that hadith. Sometimes the hadith is only about the advice of Rasulullah. It's not solely about his vision, you know. <laughs> it's just advice, you know. And what I mentioned to you just now is about Nahu Tanzi, not the Nahu Tahrim. So sometimes uh, the context of that tradition or hadith is to counsel, nasiha. Okay? Counsel is different from the ishara. Just now it's about ishara. The nasiha is for benefit and protection. And something that becomes the best for someone. So this kind of thing, when it involves counseling, it does not imply to sanction something. You can still do that, but it is not to sanction something. Okay? And then uh, there is several acts of Rasulullah and several of statements done in the context of takmil and nufus. Takmil and nufus is spiritual uplifting. For spiritual uplifting. To encourage people to follow the best form of conduct. To perfect the character. So this kind of thing involves different uh, commanded and prohibited practices of varying degrees. Some known as obligatory, some known as forbidden, some are not obligatory, like praying for the person who sneezes, so it is not obligatory, or some are not categorically forbidden, example, closest with silky extension. Uh, this is not categorically forbidden. So what does it mean? It just to avoid of showing sign of ostentation. It's not really prohibited. Just, just to, to avoid of showing a sign of ostentation and pretension. That's all. So you have to understand. Not that, oh, because, because Professor Al just mentioned to me one day when he prays somebody touch his clothes. In the midst of praying, you know, the Arab touch his clothes you know, to test whether it's a silk or not. <laughs> Because that shows that he didn't understand the context, the context of the prophetic tradition, the Sunnah. There is a report, uh, this is very interesting about this kind of case, you know. There is a report by Abu Dawood, uh, another five minutes. <laughs> Abu Dawood uh, uh, from Sayyidina Ali. Abu Dawood narrated that from Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu. Uh, he, he narrated that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Sayyidina Ali said, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade me to use gold rings. Uh, this is something now very sensitive. Eh? Gold rings to wear silk clothes, clothes dyed with saffron, and to recite the Quran while I'm in the ruku and sujud. Okay. But the interesting things mentioned by Sadina Ali after that, I'm not saying he forbade you this thing. It is only meant for me. <laughs> it, mean, it means that, what does it mean? It means that not forbidden to entire Muslim, but only to Sadina Ali. Uh, because at that time, uh, Rasulullah want to, to all the Sahaba to have a very strong sentiment of brotherhood. 
not to wear something that others doesn't can uh, cannot afford to wear that. So they will something like uh, you, you spoil the 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 sentiment of that brotherhood, and by doing that you show compassion. You know, we we say the same thing, not to not to to wear something more than you, you know? to eat something that you also eat. You know? Not even you have uh, money to buy something, but you don't buy the food that others cannot afford to buy that. So this kind of thing is very good for the school children. If you, as a parent, you can afford to to buy to to give more money to your children to buy a good food, but just give just sufficient and some like equivalent to others also to train them to to show compassion to others. Okay, and this is the way the 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 the, the, the first period how Rasulullah deal with Sabbath to create a sentiment of brotherhood. So that's why Sina Ali mentioned that he he prohibited us not to to wear gold ring. We can actually wear silk, you know. I always before I'm 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 the former PTD officer. Uh, you never fail to wear tie. <laughs> tie is part of PTD's weapon, you know. <laughs> If you are, however ignorant you are, if you are wearing tie, you still something like you are a knowledgeable person, learned, you know. <laughs> so it's the same thing like a weapon. But when you start, you start to speak, uh, people will know who you are actually. <laughs> so, so that's uh, the the most I think beautiful tie is a tie with, made with silk, you know. I have uh, several of that. Yeah, for me it's nothing. Because we know the context. It is not haram. Absolute haram. You know? Just that if you feel something, if it's something that can bring to, to a kind of pretension, you stop wearing that. You know, you know how, where and when. You, know? you, you have trained yourself. You know? so, but it is not something that should become a sanction publicly. You cannot do that. <laughs> you cannot do that. And then... Uh, there is another context, the context of teaching lofty truths. And this is also pertain to his closest companion. Okay? Let's say, for example, one example, Rasulullah SAW said to Abu Zar that he did not wish to have the like of Uhud in gold to spend except for Three pieces of gold. That what Rasul Sansa said to Abu Zar. But you know lah, Abu Zar, you know, you know Abu Zar. He take that seriously, you know. <laughs> Abu because Abu Zar thought that it was a general command applying to entire Muslim. So that's why you know Abu Zar start to to criticize uh, Muawiyah. Uh, he said that it's not it's not your your father's property. Don't spend something like this, you know. Uh, he start to criticize everybody because he misunderstood what Rasulullah said. Okay? And he always warned against accumulation of wealth. However, after that, Sayyidina Osman came and he rejected Abu Zah's understanding. He said, you, you are wrong. <laughs> it's not what Rasulullah meant. And it is not meant uh, by him prohibiting us to acquire wealth. No. <laughs> so it is only meant for him in the context of attain, attaining a lofty personality, you know, lofty personality, a good akhlaq, you know. And sometimes there is a hadith being mentioned in the context of educating and disciplining because some of uh, these hadiths might be couched by hyperbole, you know, in order to sometimes like provoke, provoke towards what? To provoke for fear or as a man uh, to, uh, as, uh, to, to rebuke, to threat, but not false under legislation. And uh, this is also interesting, you know. Uh, this I heard so many people, especially the, the, the group which end with beast, you know. Because there is a case that there is a hadith mentioned about Rasulullah having in mind, had in his mind to burn 
the house of Muslim who fail to attend the congregation prayer. Is this something familiar? Like now there is something like extremist group, you know. If you don't go to the then you would like to burn your house. <laughs> it's going to be happen one of these days, you know. Even even I think some of those group also they they translate or they they understand hadith literally. Okay. So if you don't come to like the Isha prayer to, to do the jamaah, they will burn your house. But the hadith did not did not show that Rasulullah was really going to burn the house. But that statement is made in the context of like browbeating, you know, browbeating for the sake of discipline, yeah? just to make sure that they, they will come after this, just for the sake of disciplining uh, somebody. Yeah? And actually, at that time, the one who do not come to that jamaah is hypocrite, the munafi. <laughs> That's why the threat is in that nature, you know, to burn the house. Now the one who doesn't come to the congregation prayers is like us, you know. Sometimes we just uh, come home very late from work, you know. So it's, we want to rest for a while. So we don't go to the mosque. <laughs> so if we don't go to the mosque because we are tired, want to rest for a while, don't come to our house and burn. <laughs> I think there are so many things that I think I have to stop now. It's already 11, inshallah. Uh, things that that's, is already enough about, uh, it's already sufficient and enough about Rasulullah. And if you want to know more, this, this is something that I think. Uh, not being mentioned regularly by others when they mention about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, the the one uh, that I got is something that uh, I got from uh, my our teacher Sayyid Muhammad Naqib Al Atas, and some of this thing that I mentioned in this class also I showed to him before in the midst of his writing in his new book the 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 Mitha. At the time he thinking about what to say about Rasulullah, I provide some information regarding so to him and he approved that. So the thing that I, I mentioned tonight is something that I already shown to, showed to him and it is being approved. Okay, inshallah. So may Allah inspire us, inspire, inspire our hearts with the love of Rasulullah above anything else we love. Because he said that as long as you do not love one more than anything else, he said, as long as you do not love me more than anything else, your face is not complete. Uh, that what Rasulullah said to us. So in order for us to have a complete face, so we have to love him, inshallah. So Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa, warzuqna tiba'ah, wa arina al-baqla batila, warzuqna tiba'ah, Allahumma inna nasa. من خير ما سألك منه عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما سألك منه عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم وما قضيت لنا من أمر فاجعل عاقبته رشدا اللهم آت محمد من وسيلة الفضيلة والشرف والدرجة العالية الرفضة وارزقنا الشفاعة وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك العزة عما يرفقون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين